This course is a basic course for us. It's to get you started with making wire jewelry. Oftentimes this will be a prerequisite for other classes that you may take at shows or bead stores or here at Beachcation. So we're gonna talk in depth, a lot of information I'm gonna give you today into wire, metals, different gauges, tools, why to use wet wire, how to use wet wire. I'm just gonna babble and babble, but I'm gonna give you a lot of really good information. The projects we're going to work on today is a bracelet of wire wrapped links. And this is great because you just have to make them over and over again to get the length for a bracelet. So it's a great way to perfect it. We're also gonna make some earrings. Um, before viewing this, the rest of this class, you should go and check out the free demos that we're offering here on basic wire loop and perfecting the wire spiral. Those are typically things I teach in this beginning class, but we wanted to offer them for free. But you do need to master those before moving into the rest of the wire wrap loops that I'm gonna teach you today. So with the earrings, I'm gonna use those techniques, the spiral to make a spiral head pin, and the basic loop to make the bottom of some ear wires. You're gonna learn how to make your own ear wires. You may be wondering, with all these different techniques, what's the scoop with the wire wrap loop? What's the big deal? Why would I use it? Basically, it's used for attaching beads to chain or other links of beads, that sort of thing, and the design options are limitless. It's just a very strong and attractive way to do that. Before we get started in the projects, I want to talk a lot about different metals and wire and tools, but let's get started. There's a large variety of metals out there made into wire for us to make into wire jewelry. There's silvers and golds and base metals. Let's start chatting about base metals. So you will find down at your local hardware store some copper or brass or steel to name a few. They're great because they're less expensive than the others and really nice for practicing with so you don't waste a bunch of money on just learning the technique. For golds, although you can find really fine gold wire, 14K, 12K, 24K, most commonly at bead stores and online, you'll find gold fill wire. And what that is, is a 14 karat gold layer, heat and pressure bonded to a base metal, typically brass. It's a really strong bond. This won't rub off. It holds up really nice and is a great option for gold jewelry without having to kick down the big bucks for the real gold. And it's, it's much stronger than a gold plate. There's definitely a difference. Gold plate will rub off. It's a, very, it's a much cheaper process. So I recommend sticking with the gold fill. Now for silvers, I typically work mostly with fine silver, or sterling silver. Fine silver is 99.9% .9 pure silver. Sterling silver is an alloy mix of 92.5% fine silver and 7.5% base metal, typically copper. Um, new to the market is a metal called Argentium Sterling Silver, and that is a mix of 92.5% fine silver. And instead of copper for the other 7.5%, they use a new rare element called germanium. And because in sterling, copper is the element that causes it to tarnish and oxidize. For Argentium, because it uses germanium, it's basically tarnish free. So that's pretty cool. I don't have much experience with it because it's pretty new. I stick mostly with sterling. Sterling is definitely my favorite. All right, now let's talk about different tempers of wire, different gauges of wire, and different shapes of wire. Most commonly you'll find wire round. That's what most people use, but it's also out there in triangle, half round, flat, square, even patterned. So those are fun, but much more expensive. Like I said, most people use round. For different gauges, that refers to the size of the wire. So the higher the number, the thinner the gauge. So 26 and 24 gauge are pretty fine, pretty thin, where 16 and 14 are much, much thicker. So the higher the number, the thinner the gauge. Got it? Okay, so that's how you're gonna find people referring to sizes of wire. Now let's talk about the temper of wire. That's referring to terms that you'll hear like dead soft, soft, half hard, or hard. And I get the question in class, the most common question is when to buy half hard, when to buy soft. 
and what the heck is a difference? So generally you'll see them referred to as soft or hard, or maybe they'll say dead soft or half hard. And it's referring to the softness, the stiffness, the springiness of the wire. Dead soft is it back at its natural state. So after the sterling wire or whatever wire is fabricated, they'll bring it back to dead soft. And from there, they can harden it. So some people prefer to use hardened or half hard wire for things like wire wrap loops like we're making today. If you needed to make them out of really thin wire, if you had a, a half hard wire, it would be even stronger. So tiny little wire tends to get super mushy. Half hard will retain its shape a little bit better. Sometimes I use half hard 20 gauge to make ear wires because you want the loop of the ear wire to stay really strong. Because it's already half hard, it'll retain its shape. But you can make them out of dead soft and then hammer it to give it hardness. So hammering it after you've shaped it. So really my answer to that question is it's project dependent. It really depends what you're doing. For myself, I work mostly with soft wire because it's a lot easier to harden it. I can run it through my nylon jaw pliers a couple times, or I can hammer it or pull it through a draw plate, which will shrink it and stretch it. That's a little more technical, but you can always harden soft wire. It's much harder to soften hard wire. You have to use a kiln or a torch. So again, project dependent, but if you're gonna invest in a whole bunch of wire, I would say go for the dead soft, and then you can harden it as you need to. The main reason I stick to dead soft is because I do a lot of sculptural work and I do a lot of coiling. And if you're working with half hard wire, it's just gonna fight against you. It's gonna wanna spring out of shape where if I just need the wire to mush into a place and stay there, dead soft is gonna be better. Half hard will be a little frustrating and wanna fight against me. I'd like to start by talking about the three basic tools that you need for most wire working projects. We've got chain nose, a nice flush cutter, and round nose. Definitely there's uses for many, many other tools, but we're gonna to get to those in a minute. For now, these are the must-haves. So let's first talk about chain nose. What you wanna look for in a chain nose is nice, ground down inner jaws of your plier. You don't wanna have the edges sharp. This is a Lindstrom chain nose. We're gonna talk about quality later. Um, a nice ergonomic, ergonomic handle is always helpful. And what I really like about these is the very tiny tip. You'll really, really want that with a lot of your projects where you're gonna want to get into tiny little spots and the tiny tip on these guys is very useful. Next we've got our cutters. And these are Tronix cutters. Again, we'll talk a little bit about these later. I like to work with a flush cutter, and what that means is that when you cut your wire, it leaves it really, really flat, not beveled like this. You know, the edge of your wire will be flat, not beveled. The difference there is, well, at least what you wanna look for on your cutter, is the two blades where they come together will be flush. There won't be a big dip where they come together. You want them to come across very smooth. Um, if you cut your wire with this side, it will come off beveled. So on most flush cutters, unless it's a double flush cutter, there will only be one side that cuts flush. So that's this side on these guys. Again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about quality, but take a look back there. And when you cut your wire, take a look at the wire. That's another way to tell if your flush cutter is cutting flush. So the other thing I like about these guys is it comes to a nice pointed tip. So just like with the chain nose we just talked about, I can get into a tight spot. Next we've got our round nose, and this is what we're gonna use for making loops. So each side of the jaw is round, completely round, and I work with short round nose like this for small loops, but the one I work with even more is the German round nose. It's long, and I don't care for the length of it. The purpose, really, for me of this tool is this back part of the jaw because it's got a big diameter in the jaw and I use these a lot to make bigger loops. So anywhere from about a three or four millimeter loop up to this is about eight or nine millimeters. So with pliers, the longer the jaw, the weaker it is out at the tip. So if I'm working with some heavy gauge wire, maybe 18 gauge or thicker, 
I don't work out here with this plier. Again, mainly I use it for this back part. So if I want to make little loops, I'll move over to my short round nose where I've got the short option or the thinner options here to result in a smaller loop or these guys for a bigger loop or for the heavier gauge wire way back here especially. So now we are going to move on to talking about the rest of the tools that you may want to check out. Down here again are my must-haves. Really, like I said, you need three pliers for most basic wire work projects. A cutter, a chain nose, and a round nose. But in this case, I typically will work with two round nose for the options of the size loop. So these are my must-haves. These bad boys are with me at all times. Up here are some optional pliers. This guy is called a flat nose, and you can see why. Out at the tip of the nose, it's flat rather than pointed like a chain nose, and it's ground down differently on all these edges here, where I use it for maybe grabbing wire and kinking it to make a very, very sharp angle, or I'll use it as a second hand, maybe to hold a loop still while I'm wire wrapping it. So I'll hold the loop and wrap the tail with another chain nose or flat nose. It's just nice to have two flat pliers to hold things with. Um, same kind of goes for these guys over here. These are bent chain nose. So you can see the tip of the nose is bent, but they do come to a point out here. Just two different brands here, bent chain nose. And I use those again, sort of as a second hand, or they really are great for holding jump rings to open and close them. You can use this outside angle here to get in nice and close, or when wire wrapping, this angle here is great to get into funky tight little spots. So those are great guys to have. And this is a nylon jaw plier. So the insides of the plier are nylon, so it won't harm your wire. A lot of people refer to it also as a wire straightening plier because you use it to grab wire and pull on it, I'll show you this a little bit later, to straighten it if there's any kinks in it. Originally they were mainly used for working with square wire where you need to hold the wire still because the wire length is square. You need to hold on to it so that you don't get twists within that length of square and these won't mar up your wire but you can you know, get a good grasp on it without tweaking it. These days, a lot of people are using it um, to straighten wire, which is super, super helpful. Again, we'll get to that in a minute. So now I wanna move on to talking about um, optional tools other than pliers, hammers, bench blocks, that sort of thing. Here are some other tools that you might find quite handy. Um, here we've got two different types of hammers. I'll start with this one. This is a chasing hammer and got my little name on there, sorry. <laughs> um, I use this for flattening. I'll use it to flatten wire, to harden wire, to maybe texture wire on the back here for forging, various things, but what you wanna look for here is a nice smooth head with slightly rounded edges. You'll find some hammers that are straight and flat. And with those guys, if you catch the edge at all, it will put a mar and a nick in your wire. These are just slightly rounded. You can't really see it real well there. Maybe you can on the camera, but it, the head of the hammer is slightly convex. It's not so convex that the center is really the only striking area. It's just a little tiny bit domed to soften out the edges and the surface here so that you don't get nicks all over it. And I use the back here the ball peen part just for texturing and stuff. So you'll find a lot of different hammers out there that you might like. This is the one I prefer. It's just a basic take chasing hammer. I use it for hardening or forging or shaping, flattening. This guy is a nylon jaw. No, it's not. It's a nylon hammer. <laughs> and it's made out of plastic. You'll see them also in rawhide. It's basically the same idea, which is we use this to harden wire without flattening it. So this, you can take a wire and hammer it a whole bunch on your bench block, and you'll see the difference in the wire. It stiffens up a little bit. So it's hardening the wire, but not flattening it and shaping it maybe like this guy will. So this being metal on metal will really affect your wire. Wire. This is just going to harden it. Um, I use this for maybe if I make an ear wire and I need to harden the top loop of it so it really keeps its shape but I don't want to flatten it, I'll use this guy. It's a great effect there too. This is a bench block. 
it is just a little block of very tool, start, tool hardened steel. And you definitely want to find the ones that are very hard. The cheaper ones will be a soft metal and you'll get nicks in it a lot. This is, you know, a, a little bit more expensive one. The metal is harder so it doesn't get thrashed as easily. It also comes a little bit bigger. You see them like four inch by four inch and a little thinner. Those are great too. I just like this one because it's a little more manageable and transportable. And here is a ring mandrel. It's made out of steel and it's got the actual sizes written on here. I don't know if you can see. There you see those guys on there. So you can form your ring directly on this mandrel. It is steel so you can also hammer directly on it. So this is um, definitely optional but very useful for making rings. I want to back up a little bit here and talk about quality, specifically about quality of pliers. You will see them in a large variety of quality and the great rule of thumb is just like anything else. If they're super cheap, they're probably not good quality. And what's going to happen there is they may leave a weird burr on your wire or not cut it um, flush. Maybe the chain nose will dig into your plier because they're not well made, not ground down well. Uh, the round nose may have oval shaped jaws instead of actually round. So they'll think, those are things that you'll see and if, you, if you're starting out with cheaper pliers, just stick with it for a little bit. If you're finding that those are affecting your finished pieces, it might be time to step it up. So I'll just show you a couple examples here. These are Pakistan cutters. Um, generally, and I mean generally, <laughs> not always, but generally, the tools from Pakistan, sometimes China, um, they will be a less quality tool. Moving up a step to the German tools, I really like the German tools. I've had a pair of round nose since 1989 that still have held up great. I specifically like what they're doing new these days, which is a nice ergonomic handle. It feels very comfortable in my hand, which makes a big difference. So they are ground down nice. The tips come to a nice fine point. It's a strong tool and pretty affordable there in the Germans. Um, and then stepping it up, Lindstrom is one of the highest quality hand tools that you can find. I really like the Lindstrom. Um, I use the chain nose, flat nose, round nose, and cutter. You'll also find other companies like Tronix and there's other companies out there starting to make a nice high quality tool. The Lindstrom's one thing I want to point out is these long ergonomic handles. They feel really good in my hand. I especially like the length because there is a nerve in your hand right about here that can get a little fatigue in your hand uh, by hitting it a bunch. So these guys, they go a little longer for me and it makes the tool lighter. These are really light. That makes a big difference when you're plunking out a lot of chain mail or something and you know it'll help preserve the life of your wrists. Um, I really like the Lindstrom's for that. And you will find them with ergonomic handles, like here's my ergonomic cutters, but I've had these cutters, wow, look at those boys. I've had them since about 1991, and they still cut great. It was before they came out with the ergonomic handles. Um, it's the exact same cutter, just two different handles. So you're gonna pay a little bit more for these, but it, I find them more comfortable. Um, but this is proof that they last forever, even when they're dirty. Yikes. So that's a little bit about quality. I wanna show you exactly why you want a high quality cutter. So stick with me. I think one of the very most important tools that you can invest in as far as having a good quality tool is your cutters. Here we've got a large variety of them. These are the cheapo ones. These are really nice. It's a Zeron cutter. They're nice and pointed and flush. I really like these guys. This at one point was a nice cutter, but I did something here that broke it. We can't really focus in on it. Do you see that little divot out of the jaw there? I don't remember what I did. Or perhaps I can blame it on my husband, but maybe not. But this tool is not, it doesn't have the strongest possible jaw here and if you cut something you're not supposed to be cutting it will ruin your tool there's proof of that um, you know they tool they tool harden the steel as much as possible but with these tiny little blades at the end there's only so much they can do so don't abuse and ruin your cutters like i did on these boys um, i really prefer the tronics or the lindstrom and i just want to show you i'm going to compare these two 
I want to show you exactly my, why you might want to invest in a high-end, good quality flush cutter. You can already see here that these guys, the cheaper ones, are super bulky out at the end, so you're not going to be able to get into tight spots. These are much more fine, come to a nice pointed tip there, and I really use that to cut, a co cut apart coils or to get in to cut the tip off of a nice tight wire wrap. And I want to show you the difference between the, the cuts. So I've got here a piece of 14 gauge copper wire and I'm just going to cut a tiny bit off so you can see how these guys leave it really pointed. See how that tip there is comes to a point rather than flat? And now with the flush cutter Remember with a nice quality flush cutter, anytime you cut a wire, don't cut it out at the tip like this if you're just cutting a bit off because you don't you want to preserve that tip. Let's cut it a little further back in the jaw here. This guy will leave it flat. Look at that. Nice and flat. Not pointed. And that's really important for if you are making jump rings or you're making an open loop chain because you're going to want your wires to come around and butt right up against each other. If they come together like this, that's very dangerous. They could easily open up and your chain could fall apart. So you want two flat ends to come right next to each other. So you can see the benefit of having a nice flush cut. Here we're taking a look at the projects we're going to work towards. So even though this is a technique-based class, we're going to design towards some finished pieces here so you can walk away with something. And within these finished pieces, you learn a lot of techniques. There's perfecting the spiral, basic loop at the bottom of our ear wires, how to make an ear wire and harden it, lots of wire wraps. So we've, we're going to cover a lot today. Here's what you'll need to work with. We've got 10 Freshwater pearls, they're about five or six millimeter. 12 four millimeter Swarovski bicone crystals. This piece of wire here is six inches of 20 gauge sterling. That can be dead soft or hard. And this is five feet of 24 gauge dead soft sterling. Definitely want dead soft there and a clasp. Feel free to substitute any beads in there. Just keep in mind if you're working with larger beads, your links will be longer, so you might need less wire. And if you're working with smaller beads, your links will be shorter, so you probably need more wire. Before we get started on our project, I just want to inspire you with some different design ideas. All these here, these, this necklace and this necklace, are constructed with wrapped loops. This one is gold fill wire and some big sassy beads. Over here it's sterling wire, a little bit thicker, and wrapped into some Bali silver components with some dangles that are also wire wrapped onto the circle components. Up here this necklace has got a little more advanced wire work in it, but the centerpiece is wire wrapped on. It's just a spiral head pin with a wire wrap at the top, which you can do with any bead. And we're going to learn how to do that when we make the earrings. The interesting thing here though is that this hole was pretty big, so I used a bead on the bottom and a bead on the top to kind of clog the hole so the wire didn't shift back and forth within the hole of the bead and it sort of stabilized the pendant a little better. Another great design idea is to use sections of chain and connect them with wire wrap links. That way you can incorporate some beads here and there. This necklace has used chain in these sections here and it's a lariat. It pulls right through this circle. Down at the end here a couple of those briolettes are wrapped and that's a little bit different than the, the wire wrapping we're showing you here today. Look for a class on briolette wrapping coming up soon. All right, so let's get started making your wire wrap loops. I work right off of the coil of wire or spool of wire if I have it. I find there's less waste that way. If you want to pre-cut the wire because it's a little awkward for you to work off of the spool, then go ahead and cut about three inches. Um, when I pull it off, it's a little funky there, so I'm just going to straighten it with my nylon jaw pliers. 
And I'm going to start with about one inch down on my wire. I'm going to start with my chain nose. I'm going to grab about an inch down and rotate my plier to the side to give it a nice sharp right angle. You're now going to come in with your round nose. Those are the guys with the round jaws for making loops. And put one side of the jaw right in the bend, right here, and squeeze down right on top of it. Now I've got it pretty far down my jaw because that's the size loop that I want to make. So wherever you are on the jaw will determine the size loop you make. So I'm pretty far back there. And I'm now going to take this tail and bring it up and over and around. Bring it up and over and I'm pushing pretty hard with my finger. See how I'm kind of getting a line in my finger? That's because I really want to make sure I get the shape of the plier. Now my bottom jaw is in the way so I'm just going to shift it around and continue with my wrap until it's all the way around. Now this is a spot if you were making a chain that you would go ahead and put it in, put the next link in and attach it to it before you wrap it shut. But for this first one, we're just going to go ahead and wrap it shut. You want to hold the loop still with your chain nose. These are nice and flat so they're going to hold it well and not mar up the wire. Do not do this step with your round nose. That will mar up your wire. It will form two dents right there and there. Hold still with your chain nose. And I actually prefer to hold it still in my left hand and do the wrapping with my right hand. You're going to need another pair of pliers to hold this tail and wrap it. Generally people will use another chain nose or flat nose or a bent chain nose, but if all you have is a round nose, that's okay. Just make sure you grab the tail out at the tip, not in here where you can mark it up. And you're going to bring your wraps around. I generally do two or three, and I already see a little boo-boo here, but that's good because I'm going to show you how to fix it. So I've got my wraps. And I'm going to come in with my flush cutter and trim right there. Now notice the angle I'm holding with my cutter. If I came in on top like this, it would leave a little bit poking out and I'd have to come in and burnish it down with my chain nose, sort of squeeze and squish it down. But if you come in properly with your cutter and just snip right there, right there, you won't need to do that other step. So can you see here that on my loop, my wraps are shifted down a little bit? That sometimes happens, which I'm glad it did so I can show you how to fix it. I'm going to come in with my chain nose and put one side in the loop and one side just under that. Cheat a little bit by squeezing to pull them up nice and tight. Here's a nice close up of my finished loop with the wraps. Now we are going to do the second half. So before where I had said that I work right off of the spool or coil, you actually might want to consider just cutting a big long piece of wire like this because we're now at the point where we have to put a bead on. And if you're on the spool or the coil, you're not going to be able to slip your bead on unless you remember to slip it on first, which I always forget to do. So I'm working with about eight inches of wire here. And I'm going to slide my bead on and wrap my second half. So I've just slid a pearl on. Now for the second half, you're going to come in with your chain nose and hold the wire just above the bead with the tip of your chain nose where your chain nose is about one to two millimeters thick. And that will vary according to which style chain nose you're using. But on mine, it's about there. You see that? So what I'm going to do here is make a bend and that's going to be the spot where my wraps lay. So you want to make sure it's about equal in size to over here. So again, just like before, you're going to come in with your round nose and place the round nose at that bend and on top. Make sure you're using the same side, size on your plier that you used before for equal size loops. So I'm down at the base again and I'm going to take this wire and pull it up and over. Shift my pliers out of the way. 
This side's a little easier because I have so much to hang on to. Now right there, my wire had shifted up on my pliers to here. I want to make sure to put it back to make a nice even loop. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. Again, if I was inserting another link, this would be the point where I would do that before wrapping it, and we'll go over that in a sec. So I'm going to hold it flat. This wire is so long that I can just wrap with my hand rather than another set of pliers. I'm pulling pretty tight here to get it on there nice and tight. And one last little half turn there. Come in with my flush cutters. I really like these Tronics because of that pointed tip where I can come into a nice tight spot and snip. And if your wire is poking out at all, you can sort of see it there. That's a better angle. Come in with your chain nose or your bent chain nose and squeeze it down just a tiny bit and be careful that you don't scratch the bead. So right there, squeeze. Okay, so one down. Let's start forming a chain with these. Okay, so let's do it again now, just a little bit quicker, and I'm going to show you how to interlink them to start forming your chain. So again, right up here, about an inch, I'm going to bend it down, come in with my round nose, and place it right at the bend there, far down on my round nose. My tail goes up and over, and shift my round nose out of the way, bring that tail through right there. Sometimes you have to give it a little rock, sometimes if you've gone off center. And come in with my chain nose, wrap that, oh no, there, see, I almost did it. I'm so glad I made that mistake. Let's put this in first. Yeah, now we're talking. So just slide it in there. See I'm hanging off the end? Now you wanna wrap it. So come in with your chain nose, and if you have to hold both of them, that's fine, but on this one I can just let that guy dangle out of the way. Sometimes if your loops are smaller you have to clamp down on both of them, but I'll let him just sit over there and I'm going to wrap right here, holding it in my chain nose, grabbing my tail and come up and over. Some people just twist all around. I tend to just come up and over, up and over, up and over. Getting them nice and tight next to each other, like a tight coil. And now coming in with my cutter. And trimming. Okay. I've done it again though here. My wrap got a little low, so I'm just gonna tweak it up there. Now for this link, I'm gonna add a crystal. and wrap the second half as we did before. Coming in with the chain nose, holding it at about the thickness of my chain nose, one to two millimeters. Make my bend. Come in with my round nose right at the bend. You have to be a little more careful on this side because the crystals are pretty uh, fragile. You don't want to accidentally bonk them with your tool. Bring it around. And now we switch back to the chain nose to hold it still. I've got nothing to insert here yet, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it. One, two, making sure my coils are tight, and three. Come in with my chain nose to snip it right about there. Okay, yes, cut that with your cutters, not your chain nose, sorry about that. And now come in with your chain nose for that last little squeeze. It's hard to get that one cut properly on the second side. So right here, a little tuck and be real careful not to hit your crystal. So here we are so far. Two links down. And I'll do one more so you can really get a good grasp. Okay, so let's now show one more link and I'm going to show you how to attach the clasp, which is really nothing very different than what we've been doing. But let's start with a bend 
and come in with our round nose. Bring that tail up and over and shift my plier and bring it around. Sometimes I do a little kink there. Remember, you're always gonna be finagling and finessing here to get that perfect. It's not gonna come around perfect the first time. And just by wrapping it, I don't always get it right. Sometimes I have to move my plier and tweak it a little bit. And that's okay. Now, actually I'm gonna do this side here. I'm gonna insert this, just let it click in there. Hold with your chain nose right there. Now grab and wrap. I come around two to three times. Come in with my cutter. Trim. And I'm on the side now with the pearl. So let me add in a pearl here and make my second loop. Start here with my chain nose, bend, and with the big part of my plier round nose here to make sure I get the right size. Actually, I'm shifted off a little bit. See how I'm kind of out here? You need to make sure you're right there in that bend. Bring it around and bring that tail around. Okay, now for this end, we're gonna put on, sorry, the loop end of our toggle. I'm just gonna slide it on there, kinda click it into place, and then wrap like we did before. Flip it around, and right here, we're gonna just finish it off with our wraps. Okay, and get in with our cutters as close as we can. Snip and burnish it down if we need to. For this step, a lot of people really like to use the bent chain nose because you can get into these certain spots, you know, real easily. I'm just used to using my chain nose, so I'm just going to come in right there. Okay, so there we are so far, we're plugging along. I wanna show you a finished one here so I can point out that when you're making your chain with this toggle, it's pretty small. So make sure that you end your T-bar side with a crystal. It doesn't matter what you end with over here. This part can be a crystal or a pearl, but you're gonna need the crystal because it's nice and small. It'll allow the T-bar to pull up and through your toggle clasp. If there was a pearl there, it might be too big to pull up and through and you won't be able to complete your clasp. Let's now work on making the earrings. Take a second now and make sure you watch and practice the free demo that we have on perfecting the wire spiral. Go ahead and work on that and then come on back and we're gonna work on making a spiral at the bottom here, which we're then gonna turn into a head pin add on a couple beads and do a wrapped loop there. Uh, we're gonna make both sides of that and then I'm gonna teach you how to make an ear wire there out of 20 gauge. All right, now that you have viewed the free demo on spiraling, let's make a little spiral here at the end of our 24 gauge. And I just cut about a foot and a half off of my coil so I have a workable piece of wire. Come in with the very tip of your chain nose, grab the very, very tip of the wire, just the smallest bit you can get and bring it up and around so it's like a little kink. Now coming in with your chain nose, you're gonna smash that in and then hold that flat within the jaw of your pliers and spiral around it. And I'm gonna come around uh, two or three times. Just remember how many times you went so you can duplicate it for the other earring. Let's go around three times. Now right before I complete the other side, I actually come a little ways out and form my kink so that when I come up here and continue my spiral, it rolls right up over that to center it. Okay. 
Now we're going to put our beads on. Let's see, I'm going to go crystal, then pearl, bring them down, and form a wire wrapped loop on top of that. So coming in right here with my chain nose, form my bend, come in with my round nose right at that bend, and bring it up and around. Sorry, there's another airplane. Can we just ignore that? I think so. Right there. And then we're going to wrap by holding it flat within the jaw of your chain nose plier. I like to flip it over because I prefer to wrap with my right hand and lay the wraps right there. Okay, and let's trim. Now, like I said before, you're probably going to almost always do some problem solving. Now, right there, I cut pretty long. I'm going to see if I can recut that. I'm going to just trim that little bit off again with my cutter and burnish it down with my chain nose. Now, take a look at your loop and see if you're happy with it. Mine is off a little bit on the side, so I can come in right here with my chain nose and center it. And that looks pretty good to me. So go ahead and make this one and the other side as well. Let's get started making the ear wires. You can see them here. We're going to do a basic loop at the bottom and a nice big round loop to go through the ear and a little kink that helps it from falling out. So what you want to start with first is you want to cut your wire to about three inches. This is your 20 gauge dead soft wire. You can also use half hard for this wire because it already has a little bit of spring and strength to it to help retain this nice ear wire shape. Um, we're going to start with dead soft and I'll show you how to harden it. So the very first thing you want to do is make a loop at the bottom of your wire. Uh, take this opportunity to view our free demo on make, making basic loops so you can master that before moving on here because I'm going to go over it pretty quickly. Very first thing you want to do is get a flush cut on the end of this wire. So take your flush cutter and using the flush side of your flush cutter, trim that little bit off. So you have a nice flat cut here. Now come in with your round nose and we're just going to make a basic loop. So grab the wire in between the jaws of the plier. You don't want to feel it poking up at all. If it's poking up just a tiny bit, it'll make a teardrop shape. So it needs to be down within the jaw of the pliers. I push the wire against my plier with my thumb here and roll away from me. This finger is sort of just resting here, but don't let it push against the plier or get in the way. So here we go. I'm just going to roll away from me, loosen my grip so I can come back and continue that rotation as many times as you need to until it comes around and touches, making a P. So now I need to kink that P to the side to center it. You can do that with your round nose if you're working with thin gauge. With a thicker gauge, you're not going to have enough strength in your round nose, so you're going to have to come in with your chain nose. Let's just do it here since I've got this guy here. Grab with one side of the tool in the loop, one side right on the outside right there, and kink it to center it so it's like an eye pin now. Now we're going to put on a crystal. And now what we need to do is form this kink right here. See how we have the loop and the crystal and then it sort of kinks out and then goes into our curve there. Typically if we were working with a bigger bead or a thinner wire we could just grab it and push the wire this direction but it won't work with this thick of a wire. This is 20 gauge and this fragile of a bead. So you're going to have to come in with your chain nose and grab it about a half a millimeter higher than the bead. If you grab right next to the bead, when you go to kink it, you will butt your tool up against the crystal and crack it. So you need to be like the tool width's length away from the bead. 
and crack that, <laughs> crank that to the side. Now we're going to come in with either a thick Sharpie pen. You can use this to form that loop. We'll do that with this one. Or on the next one, we're going to use another little handy tool. But for this one, I'm going to hold it right up against the Sharpie pen and pull the tail up and around to form my, my nice little curve there. Now if you find this is too long, come in and trim it a little bit. And with your chain nose, grab it and give it a little bit of a kink. So there's one ear wire. Some people prefer this to be a little bit smaller, in which case you can use a thinner pen. Um, yeah, so this little loop right here has opened up a little bit. I'm going to show you how to make sure that's nice and closed. Just grab it and wiggle it back and forth as you close it, kind of like closing the jump ring. So let's do the other one real quick, and I'm going to show you a different tool to use besides a pen. Let's start with a flush cut. Come in with the round nose, grab it between your pliers, using the same spot that you did with the first side. Mark it with a Sharpie if you feel you need a little reminder there. Roll away from you, loosen your grip, bring it back, continue until it touches. See that it's touched there. And since you're already here with your round nose, you can just rock it back and kink it. Now let's put on our crystal. Give a little kink right here. Sorry. Okay. Right there. Now this is my latest favorite tool. This is a medium wrap and tap, and you can see it's a stepped round nose plier with different thicknesses here. I'm going to use this thickest spot on my plier to make the part that's going to go through the ear. So I'm just going to hold it like that. And sort of like we did with the Sharpie, I'm just going to pull this around, all the way around, pushing nice and tight. And that too gives you a nice curve. So it looks like maybe three inches was a little bit long for this. People like the length of the tail here to be different. That's just a design element, really. It's what you prefer. I seem to be cutting about a half an inch off either one, so I could have maybe done my initial cut at two and a half inches rather than three. Take that little kink right there. So here's my pair. They're looking pretty good. Now, you want to make sure that you have a lot of strength here so that as you put the earring in and out, you don't lose that shape. This is pretty soft right now. So to ensure that, I'm going to use my bench block and I'm going to hammer right here, which will work hard in this curve of my ear wire. If I wanted to hammer it but didn't want to change the shape, I would use a nylon mallet like this. This will harden it, but it will not change the shape. So it's definitely more springy now less likely to distort. Or you can come in with a chasing hammer. This will flatten it a little bit. You don't want to flatten it too much or it's uncomfortable in your ear. But it does harden it even more than a nylon mallet or a rawhide mallet. So that's very springy. Okay, just to complete this guy, all we have to do just come in, oops, not your round nose, use your chain nose to hold the tip of that loop, pull it open that way, like you would a jump ring. Don't do it like this, because you'll distort it. You more want to do it like that. So pull it open, insert your drop, your charm, whatever you're putting on your ear wire, and close it by wiggling it back and forth letting that wire scrape against the opposite side to make sure it's nice and tight. So here's my finished earring. Um, I hold it up or let it hang straight down and notice where everything is facing. And if you look at this, my spiral is facing 
left to right, not forwards. So I'm going to have to grab this and shift it a little bit. You definitely have a little bit of play. That's better. With these guys, you don't want to be doing that all day or you'll snap it, but you definitely can adjust it. So there is your finished earring. All nice and hardened, ready to be worn. Alrighty, we are all done. I've given you tons of information. This is a great class because you learn a lot about pliers and different tools and wires and different metals. And then we did a pretty cool project. So practice a bunch. Typically this class is prerequisite for a bunch of other intermediate and advanced wire work classes. So by getting this one under your belt, you're ready to move on and step up to some other projects. Have a great time wrapping it all up and thanks again for coming by. <music>